standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. And I'm going to begin with a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel, and if you're able, you can kneel with me. Otherwise, you can stay seated. Gracious Father in heaven, Father, it is with a grateful heart that I bow before thee and give thee thanks, O Lord, for the precious privilege we have to open thy word. And I pray for the privilege and honor to, to share thy word with thy people today. I pray that thy Holy Spirit will lead and guide in all things that are shared. Father, we want, I want thy name to be honored and glorified in the name of thy son, Jesus, to be uplifted as he prayed that if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. Father, that is my hope and desire today, that through the things that are written in thy word, that Jesus may be uplifted before our minds and hearts, that we may be drawn to him and ultimately to thee. Father, we bless thee and thank thee, and I ask that thou will give thy servant grace. Be with my lips that those words that I speak may be thine and not mine, that thy holy name, may be exalted in all that is shared. For this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I wanted to share today, we're, this is going to be a three-part message. In our first message, we're going to be looking at what I've called the figures of salvation. And by figures of salvation, by a figure, what I mean is a type or a symbol. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament and the way in which God has revealed the plan of salvation, the plan of, what we know, redemption, through the Old Testament types or symbols, and hence I've called them figures of salvation. God foreshadowed good things to come. As we have here on our, our little flyer or our schedule, Hebrews 10, verse 1. For those of you who don't have one, raise your hand. We can get you one. This is kind of our theme. Hebrews 10.1 says, For the law, and the law here spoken of, is what we call the typical or ceremonial law. The law referring to the, the sacrifices and offerings to be made in the yearly round of the sanctuary service. It says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come. So what kind of things were to come? Good, good things. And they are called a shadow. Now, I know we're all familiar with shadows, right? Is the shadow the real thing? No. no, but the shadow does what? It points back to the original. If you trace the shadow from its, where you can see it, you trace it back, you will find the original. A type is a shadow. It casts a shadow forward, and these laws, these ceremonial laws, were called shadows of good things to come. And as we trace it back, we're going to see the good things that were promised in these yearly round of sanctuary service. Good things to come, says the apostle, and not the very image of the things, as we saw. These, he said, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So these offerings that were made, the shedding of animals' blood, could not make the comers thereunto perfect. Those that offered those sacrifices could not be made perfect without something greater, that which all these things pointed back to. And that's what I want to share with us today. And we're not going to look so much at the particulars of the sanctuary service, <clears throat> but I want us to look at the key features, that which was a part of what we call the daily service. And in our last message, we're going to look at the most important part of the yearly service, the Day of Atonement. But we're going to begin by looking at one of the most important services that was carried out in the sanctuary every single day. And this service has rich meaning. It's called the Burnt Offering. And we're, today we're going to look at the Burnt Offering and we're going to look at it in two parts. And I want us to begin by looking at what the book of Exodus in chapter 29 has to say. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open up there with me. Otherwise, you can read off of the screen. Exodus chapter 29. We're going to read verse 18. 
Notice what Moses is here commanded. Again, that's Exodus 29, verse 18. Now the Lord is here giving instruction to Moses concerning the sanctuary service, particularly referring to the burnt offering. And he says, And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Now how many here have smelled burning fat, animal fat, we've smelled burning meat and burning fat. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not a sweet savor to me. It has become a familiar scent. I recognize it when I smell it, but it's not a sweet savor. And it might seem like a strange thing when God says that the smell of this burnt offering was to him a sweet savor. Something that smelled, a savor meaning a a smell or taste, that was tasted or smelled sweet. What was it about this burnt offering that made it sweet in the eye of God? I want us to look at that and notice that how much of the ram was consumed. What does it say? The The whole ram was to be consumed. So this is what we call the whole burnt offering. And that is itself significant. And first off, I want us to look at the most important aspect of the burnt offering, the most important role that it played. And that was found in what is called the continual or daily burnt offering. There are two types of burnt offering you find in the sanctuary service. The first was called the daily or continual. It was to be done every morning and every evening, hence it is called continual. And the second, we'll note momentarily. But first, let's take a look at this continual burnt offering. Turn with me in the same chapter, Exodus chapter 29. We'll skip down about 20 verses. And we're going to begin with verse 38 and also read verse 39. So that's Exodus 29. Verses 38 and 39. Thus says the Lord, Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, speaking of the altar of burnt offering, which was found in the courtyard. That is the altar here referred to. Now this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar. Two lambs of the first year, day by day, how? Continually. Hence its name. The continual burnt offering. Now, how many were burnt? Two. And when were they burned? Verse 9, 39. Let's read it. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer when? At even or evening. And so we have two lambs that were to be consumed wholly every day. The one was offered when? In the morning, the other in the evening, which symbolized its continual nature. It represented that which was considered for the whole day. So the evening and the morning, these offerings were made. Now, they were continual, and we see the time in which they occurred. Let's look a bit at their significance. Let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 29. Now, these are the words of John the Baptist. And we know John the Baptist was a student of the Bible. He understood Scripture. And when he laid eyes upon Jesus for the first time, he spoke these words. It's John chapter 1, verse 29. He said, The next day John, that is the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him, And saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now those words are significant. I don't know if John the Baptist fully understood the significance of the words that he spoke on that day. He said, Behold the Lamb. Now the Lamb was the typical animal used in the burnt offering. We know that there were two lambs of the first year. They were to be yearlings. 
So they had not reproduced. They were, in a sense, virgins. That was the significance of them being a yearling. And they were representations of the one that was to come, the one who we just read of in this verse. The Lord Jesus Christ was typified by these lambs. In fact, by all the offerings and sacrifices that were made in the sanctuary service, all typified Christ. But Christ's sacrifice is so broad, so grand, that it is typified by many different symbols representing the different ways in which salvation is brought to man. But I want us to notice, you'll notice I highlighted on the screen one important word. What is that word? World. World. When we think of salvation, we think of Christians, don't we? But whom did this lamb take the sin away of? The world. Not just those that believe, but all in the world. And this whole burnt offering that was given continually in the morning and in the evening typified this offering. This lamb was to take away the sin of the world. Now that sin was the sin of Adam. Adam brought sin into the world, and through him, sin was brought in. And all have sinned, according to the word of God, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That sin has been pardoned. Man has been justified. He has been given by this sacrifice probation. God made a provision for the salvation of mankind, and that is what is typified in the burnt offering. All men are on probation. All men have been given back the opportunity to choose whom they will serve. They are no longer under the condemnation. They are free to choose whether they will receive the offering God has provided or they will choose their own way. This sacrifice made provision for that. That is why Jesus is called the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Not simply the sin of those that believe or the believers, but he takes away the sin of the world. He's taken that sin upon him. And he has, in a sense, justified all those that have been born of Adam. They have been given a second chance. Each and every one of us has received this second chance through this burnt offering. Notice also, Revelation 13, verse 8. This is not the only time in which it is referred to. It's referred to a number of times. In Revelation 13, verse 8, the Apostle John, under inspiration, says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, speaking of this beast that is spoken of in the first seven verses, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Slain when? From the foundation of the world. This burnt offering was sacrificed, provided at the foundation of the world. Otherwise, none of us would be here. None of us would have had the ability to choose salvation if it were not for this sacrifice. It provided for our salvation. And so there is a provisional aspect to the sacrifice which Christ made. He gave every man opportunity to believe, to choose once again whom his master would be. Adam had chosen the devil. Eve had chosen the devil. And every man since, at one point in their life, had chosen the devil. But Christ came to give them opportunity to choose once again who their master would be. In Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, God revealed this unto the Old Testament patriarch Abraham. It was in a dream of the night. God appeared unto Abram while he was sleeping in his bed and told him to arise to take his son Isaac and offer him upon the mount which he would specify. Now Abraham knew God. But you could imagine the surprise and shock he must have felt when God said, I want you to take the son, the son that I promised you, the son that you received when you were an old man, 
He said, I want you to take the son and offer him as a sacrifice on the mount that I will tell thee. Of course, Abraham was shocked. But Abraham, you see, feared God. He believed God. He knew that God had a purpose in everything that he asked. And even though it didn't make sense to him, Abraham obeyed. He rose up. He did not disturb his wife. He knew the turmoil it would cause in her heart. So he rose up silently, prepared everything, woke his son, told him that they were going to go on an errand and sacrifice unto the Lord. And so they went early in the morning with the servant, everything prepared. They had the wood, they had the fire, and they made their way. And as they approached the hill, God said, here is the hill that I want you to offer your son on. And so Abraham told his servant to stay there with the animal, and they took the wood and the fire, and they began to make their way up the hill. And as they made their way up, Isaac looked about and he said, Oh, Father, we have the wood and we have the fire, but where's the lamb? He understood that he had participated in the, in the sacrifices of his father, and he understood that a lamb was to be offered as a burnt offering. And you can imagine the pain that it would have caused in the heart of Abraham hearing those words, knowing what was to come. He had not uttered a word on the whole journey because his heart was so burdened. But now he couldn't hold his peace. And moved by inspiration, Abraham spoke these words. Genesis 22, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. For a what? A burnt offering. So it was to be a burnt offering, you see. And God was revealing to Abraham what was to come. And notice what also God would provide himself. This was to be God's provision. It was not something that man was to do. Man could do nothing to earn his salvation. It was to be God's provision by which man was to be saved. God alone could save mankind. And it's by our faith in believing of the provision that God has made that we are saved. By faith, through grace. And the offering of this burnt offering was grace, which God had provided. And he provided himself a lamb. And this lamb typified the provision for the whole world. God was revealing to Abraham his great purpose. God had in store for the whole human race good things. God would that all men should be saved. He's not willing that any should perish. And God revealed his, his beneficent plan to Abraham. I would that all men should be saved. And Abraham saw that day when he was raising the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord stayed Abraham's hand as he was about to bring the knife down. And the Lord said, Now I know that thou fearest God, because thou wouldst not withhold thine only son from me even as God had not withheld his only begotten son from us. He saw the fear of, of God in Abraham, and he allowed that to take place, to be on record for our benefit of what kind of faith God desires of us, the what kind of sacrifice is needed. And as the angel stayed Abraham's hand, he was pointed to a thicket of thorns, off atop the hill. And there in the thicket was a ram caught by his horns. And the angel said, Go, take the lamb, or the ram, and offer him for a burnt offering for the Lord. That ram, that whole burnt offering, was a representation of the offering of God's only begotten Son, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So first off, we see that the burnt offering provided for the salvation of all mankind. It was provisional, and it was sufficient for everyone. None need miss out. None need be lost. God has provided for every single one of us. And there is a second aspect to the burnt offering, and this one is called the free will. This was instituted in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had sinned, God instituted this sacrifice. It was called the free will burnt offering. And it's called a free will offering because it is given of our own volition. 
we choose to bring it as a symbol of our faith in the provision that has been made. And so it is called the free will or volitional burnt offering. We bring it of our own accord. Let's note a couple things about it. In Leviticus chapter 1, Leviticus chapter 1, we're going to read verse 3. We're going to see why it was given the name that it was. Leviticus 1, verse 3, reads, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. How was he to offer it? Of his own free will. It was not mandatory. God has not required it. God has not required any of us to believe. We must believe of our own free will. And God has given us back our free will through the gift of his son. And so in order for us, for this sacrifice to be accepted on our behalf personally, we have to express our faith in the free will offering, the burnt offering. And notice also what kind of creature it was. It was a male and it was to be what? Without blemish. Now, what is a blemish? An imperfection, right? It couldn't be lame. It couldn't be scarred. It had to be perfect. And this was a representation of the offering that God made. God did not bring a lame offering. He did not offer a lame offering for us. He gave the very best. He gave his son. And there is no better in heaven. He is the prince of of heaven. He had the form and glory of God. He was God in nature. The very best that heaven had to offer was given to us. And God requires that when we bring our offering by faith, we are to acknowledge the gift that God has given by bringing our very best. It was to be a lamb without blemish. And notice also, we see this in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4. The very first record we have of an offering made is a burnt offering. And it was brought by Adam's second son. His name was Abel. And of Abel's sacrifice, we read Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4. And Abel... He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So we learn a couple things here. One is Abel brought that which God required. That's why God had respect unto Abel's. Now we are told that God did not have respect unto Cain's. Cain brought of the fruit of the earth. He brought of the fruit of his own labor. Cain had raised up the fruit. They were the product of his own labor, and they were, it was a bloodless sacrifice. It did not require sacrifice. There was no shedding of blood. And in it, there was no respect unto God for the offering that he had made. And so God had no respect for Cain's offering. But when Abel came, he brought, it says, of the firstlings of his flock. Now that word firstlings means chief, the best. It's a, and it also implies the firstborn, that which was first that came out of the womb. Abel brought the very best. He didn't choose one that he didn't like. He didn't say, oh, this one's kind of scrawny. He's not my favorite, so I'll take him. He brought the one that was his favorite, the one in whom his heart delighted. And when it says the fat thereof, that word fat can denote body fat. It can denote the fat of uh, animals. It can denote even the oil or fat of foods. But it also has a symbolic sense. When you talk about the fatness of something, we talk about the richest, the best, that which is the sweetest, the most savorful. It's fat that makes it 
have savor. And that I believe the, the term fat here is in respect to the type of offering that Abel brought. He didn't simply bring blubber or fat as an offering. He brought the animal and he brought the chiefest and the best. The firstlings and the fattest. The handsomest, the best that he had, he brought to the Lord. And we learn in this what it means to believe in the Lord. Abel showed his faith. He recognized what God had given, and he expressed his appreciation for what God had done for him in his offering. And so we see in this a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the firstling. He was God's only begotten son. He's the heir of heaven, the son of God, and he is the chiefest and fairest of all. And Abel typified that in his offering. Notice also what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3. We see the one of the significances of this offering called the free will offering. Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Now Paul is here speaking about the sacrifice that Abraham offered upon Mount Moriah, which we read in Genesis chapter 22. He's making reference to this occasion. And there he says, in Galatians 3, verse 8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify whom? The heathen. God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. How many? All nations. All who have come from the loins of Abraham, in other words, or all who have come from the loins of Noah after the flood. All have populated the earth. God says that in Abraham, all nations will be blessed. All those that have come upon the face of the earth will be blessed through him. Why? Was there something special about Abraham? Not necessarily. But God had chosen him to be the father who would bring forth his son upon the earth. It was through the lineage of Abraham that Christ was to be born. The seed promised to Abraham, we read in Galatians, he said, he said not of seeds as of many, but of thy seed as of one, even the Lord Jesus Christ. So the seed promised to Abraham was not Isaac. Yes, that God promised him a son, But the seed that was promised that would be a blessing to all nations was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who came of Abraham. And this, in this sacrifice, in this offering, which was a free will offering, God said that it typified that all the heathen would be what? Justified. The heathen are the nations, all the nations of men. So in this sacrifice, God made provision for the justification of the whole world. Now, that does not mean that the whole world will be saved. Provision has been made for them to be saved. The sin, the condemnation that Adam's sin brought has been atoned for by the sacrifice. They are now free to choose once again. So they have been justified in a sense, not justified from their personal sin, which we'll note in our second message. So let's go back now to Leviticus chapter 1. Let's look at a couple things that are told us about this burnt offering. It's in the first chapter of Leviticus. We're going to read verses 7 through 9. Verse 6 tells us that we're, it's talking about the burnt offering says that it was to be flayed, that is, its skin was to be cut off, and it was to be cut into his pieces. Verse 7, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar, and lay wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order upon the wood that is on the fire, which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water, And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice 
an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, there are a number of things in these verses that are very important for us to note in regard to this. And I want you to notice the importance that God stressed in how things are done. God is a God of order, and we're going to see it. God specified that the burnt offering was to be cut into his pieces. It was not just to be randomly butchered. It was to be cut into specific pieces, and then wood was carefully laid in its order, not just thrown on the fire. It was put in order upon the fire. And then the sacrifice was put in its order upon the wood, which was upon the fire. God is specific. Everything has a lesson for us. And this lesson is order. God has an order to everything. God wants us to know that he is a God of order. He is not a God of confusion. God is not a God of happenstance or what we might call luck. God makes provision, and everything that he does has a purpose and a plan. And this is revealed in the burnt offering. It is cut into his pieces, and those pieces are carefully laid upon wood that has been carefully laid on the fire, showing us how God has done it. And God wants us to follow suit, to recognize that in his church there is to be order, perfect order in all things. And notice also that the sacrifice, the inward parts, what we would call the digestive system, all the inward organs, together with the legs, were washed in water. Now they might say, well, they're going to be burnt anyway. Why did he have to go through all of that just to burn them for a lesson? For a lesson for us. God accepts no unclean thing. There is not a stitch of filth or sin on this creature. It has been washed clean inside and out. And that is to represent the offering that God made. See, God didn't just give an outward sacrifice. He made a sacrifice that cost him everything. And it typifies that the heart, the inward part of God's offering, his son, Jesus Christ, was perfect. It was clean and washed by the water. Note, Hebrews chapter 9. We'll come back to that washing in a moment. But there's an aspect that took place even before of all of this. And Paul notes it in Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Paul says, And almost all things are by the law, that is speaking of the ceremonial or typical law, of the sanctuary service, and almost all things are by the law purged with what? Blood. Now, doesn't that seem like an odd thing to purge something with? Blood? Yes, and it sh it's supposed to strike us as odd because God has a lesson in it for us. We think of blood as something that stains and defiles, and normally it does. But the blood of this sacrifice cleanses, it purifies, purges, as it were. Almost all things are, by this law are purged with blood. And notice what he says now. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Now, I don't know if you've thought about that much, but the whole burnt offering was not simply a bloodletting. God didn't make a small incision, gather a little bit of blood, and then apply it. The shedding of blood indicates death. It's talking about death. It's not simply talking about drawing blood, like when you give blood when you go to the hospital or the blood bank. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the life being drained out completely to where there's none left. Complete death. Jesus poured out his soul unto death. That word soul is synonymous with blood in Old Testament and New. It's used as a synonym. The life, the soul, in the original, is in the blood. That life was poured out. It was shed, all of it, 
for us. Nothing was left in the offering. Every aspect, every part, every feeling, every emotion, every action was poured out for the well-being of human of humanity. Christ gave all upon the altar of sacrifice. And so that's why Paul is saying without the shedding of blood, he's not simply talking about giving blood, but pouring out your whole life to God, laying all upon the altar of sacrifice. That is what is typified in the burnt offering. It denotes not only the provision that God has made, but the complete consecration of the offerer to God. Just as Christ was consecrated to the salvation of, human, of humanity, so every believer is to be consecrated to God, back to God. And that is the significance of the shedding of blood. And it represents purging. When we are willing to lay all upon the altar of sacrifice, when we are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for God, it shows that all is offered, that we are purged and clean, that there is no stain of sin left. When we are willing to make that commitment, it is a revelation to heaven and to God that we are pure and clean. And Christ's blood has cleansed us of every sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll read first verse 40. This I noticed, I noted before. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40 says, Let all things be done decently and how? In order. Now Paul is here talking about what is to be done in the church. It's to be done decently, with respect, with decency, and it is to be done in order. Now God is a God of order. Everything he does is on time, down to the very second. The Passover prophesied the very day and the very hour, the moment at which Christ would die between the evens. At that very moment, Christ gave up his life. God, when he prophesies it, it happens at the very moment he says it will happen. His word does not return unto him void. God is a God of order. Everything he has planned is on schedule. And God wants us to know this. And this is how we are to function within the church. We are to treat each other decently, and we are to do all things in order. And notice verse 33. God backs this up by, in verse 33, telling us, for God is not the author of what? Confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. And going back to this washing of the sacrifice, the burnt offering, the inward parts, in Psalm 24, we see the significance of this act. The psalmist tells us of it in song. It's Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. There the sweet singer of Israel said, asking a question, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? Verse 4, the answer, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So he is spoken of here as cleansed. His hands and his heart have been cleansed. They've been washed clean. Who shall stand before God in the last days? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. Those who, like Christ, have been purified inside and out. And in Psalm 51, in similar language, 51st Psalm, verse 17, the psalmist writes, The sacrifices of God speaking of those sacrifices that were offered in the services, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. What do the burnt offerings specifically represent? That's right, a broken heart, a contrite heart. One that knows its sin. One that recognizes its condition. It's been broken by a sense of its own guilt. By my sin... I caused the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. It breaks the heart. And when the heart is broken, it is a sacrifice unto God. 
That's how we today bring our offerings before the Lord. We don't bring it with the, the blood of bulls or of goats or of lambs. We bring it with a contrite and broken heart, a recognition of our sin and what it has caused God. We come with a broken and contrite heart. And God says, this I will not despise. So let me conclude. I want to finish with a thought. I want us to understand the significance of the burnt offering and how we can apply it in our lives today. We don't bring goats or lambs to God. There's no temple in which we are to bring our offerings physically. But there is a place where sacrifice is offered to God. And the Apostle Paul remarks upon it in the 12th chapter of Romans, verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore. Do you know what beseech means? Beg, yes, or to plead. When you beg with someone, you're pleading. It's a pleading tone. Paul is saying, I beseech you. He's calling upon us in a pleading tone. Brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What are the sacrifices of God that we offer today? Ourselves. We bring ourselves holy, without reserve, and that's what the burnt offering represents. We come to God withholding nothing. All is put upon the altar, and all is consumed for God. Save one part. The skin. The skin was flayed and was kept by the priest. So that was a, the portion that belonged to the priest, was the skin of the sacrifice. Now that's kind of a side point, but everything else was consumed upon the altar. Everything that was in the life, everything in the heart, everything that belonged to us, that has meaning, is laid upon the altar. It now belongs to God. There's no reserve, nothing is held back. There's no stingy gift like Ananias and Sapphira that sold all their belongings, kept half, and brought half to God. Now, there would have been nothing wrong if they had brought half and said, Lord, here is half of all that we have sold, and we want to give this to your work. God would have been pleased. But they said, this is all. They lied to God. They did not tell him that they had put in reserve half of it. They only brought half and said, it is all. And these type of offerings are an abomination to God. If we want to give part of our life to the Lord, the Lord will accept our offering. But that which alone will bring salvation, that which alone is acceptable to bring redemption and the salvation of our souls, is the offering of the burnt offering. All must be brought. All must be brought to God. It is to be a living sacrifice. We don't offer it by idleness, do we? We offer it in every prayer. We offer it in every work as we go about our daily chores around the home. We are giving an offering to God as we speak to our, our wife, our children, our loved ones, our friends, our family. We are to remember that we are bringing an offering to the Lord. All our work is to be consecrated to him in seeking to win souls, to influence them for good, to turn their hearts to the Lord. Our life is to be given as a sacrifice back to God. And Paul says it is acceptable. God receives our sacrifice when nothing is held in reserve. And it is, he calls, our reasonable service. In the original, it's the logical. It makes perfect logic. God has not withheld anything. And so this offering of ours is to be in kind. It's reasonable. If God has given all, we should give all. It has God cost God infinitely more than it will ever cost us. 
and we are to show forth our gratitude, our appreciation for what God has done for us by giving our lives unreservedly to him. And it's my hope and prayer that each and every one of us have made that decision. But if we have not made that decision, then I want to invite you to make that decision now. If the Lord is working upon your heart and you hear his spirit speaking to you about something in your life that you have not let go of, that you have not sacrificed to God, I want you to make that choice now. I want you to give that which the Lord wants of thee to him. And in return, God offers you forgiveness and peace. He offers you the very best that heaven can offer. God wants you to know the height, the breadth, the depth of his love. He wants you to know peace that passeth all understanding, joy and happiness, not only in this life, but to know it in the life to come when our eyes behold things that they cannot behold here. And if that's your desire, then I would invite you to kneel together with me in a word of prayer. Where are you? The Lord knows. Otherwise, please bow your head. O gracious Lord and Father of all, Lord of heaven and earth, Father, we come before thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus. We bless thee and give thee thanks, O Lord, for thou art good and kind. Thou art indeed merciful and gracious, long-suffering, tender and compassionate toward us erring sons of men. Father, we have beheld, as it were, a glimpse of thy goodness in this burnt offering. We see that thou hast withheld nothing for our salvation. And Father, we want to acknowledge ourselves before thee as sinners, those in need of salvation. And Father, we want to lay all upon the altar of sacrifice today. We want to commit our souls to thy keeping. We want to commit all that we have, both possession and in our hearts and minds, to thee, to be consecrated to thy service. We want our hands and our feet to be washed and clean, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And we pray, Father, that thou wilt accept our sacrifice, for we know that thou wilt. And I pray, Father, that thy spirit will come into our hearts, that we will know forgiveness and know the peace that thou hast promised. That we, Father, may know the joy of heaven and that we may be able to reach out to others and that they too might come to know that joy and peace. Father, we want thy love to flood our souls so full that it overflows in words and in deeds. We want to be a blessing as Jesus prayed. We want to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Please fill us with the savor of heaven. And Father, we bless thee and thank thee for hearing and answering our prayer. I thank thee for each and every one who has come today. And I pray, Father, that thou will draw near unto each and every one of us, that thy Holy Spirit be present with us as we continue through this Holy Sabbath day. And we ask this in the precious name of thy Son, Jesus, and give thee thanks. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions